Hello there, how you doing? Welcome to episode one of The Journey. Uh, my name is Pete Snodden. If you've listened to the introduction on this podcast series, you'll know what it's all about. But if you haven't, I'll, I'll tell you very quickly. I want to speak to people who are as passionate about their jobs and what they do, their careers, uh, as I am. And to hear about their journey, how they got to where they are right now, the pitfalls, uh, the amazing moments along the way, and the lessons that they've learned in getting to where they are. So here in episode one, I reached out to a gentleman who I watch on television all the time. If you are a football fan, you'll know this guy. Um, he is the lead anchor uh, at Sky Television for their Premier League coverage. So he's in the company every week of the likes of Jamie Carragher, Jamie Redknapp, Gary Neville, Graham Soonis, the list goes on. Uh, he is an incredible broadcaster doing an incredible job and right at the height of his profession. I really enjoyed the chat. He was an absolute gentleman. I've never met him before, um, but he was really open. He was really honest, and he has had one incredible journey. So here we go, episode one of The Journey, this week with Sky Television's Dave Jones. The Journey with Pete Snodden. So, David Jones, I, I, I see you in Sky at the weekend. Not so much now uh, with Super Sunday and Monday Night Football, but um, I see you in Sky doing the football show and I've been watching your career over the years. First up, many congratulations. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. Are you, um, are you living the dream? <laughs> I suppose I am, yeah. Yeah. Um... I mean, those dreams have changed a lot down the years. I often get asked when I started my journalistic career whether uh, I had this in mind. And probably the, the initial answer would have been no. But there was, there was in the back of my mind always um, a degree of confidence that I, would, that I would go beyond the norm if that makes sense and I was never going to settle for just any old job um, I always sort of backed my ability to take me as, as far as it was going to and and you know sometimes in life you you just have to be in the right place to have those opportunities fulfilled now there are there have been a million sliding door doors moments in that journey all the way back to school but um, the stars have aligned and here we are and yeah, loving every minute of it. Do you feel you have to make your own luck? I know you talk about the door just being, you know, a lot of sliding door moments, but do you believe you have to make those doors open yourself? Sometimes. I always say to people that when you see an opportunity, you have to make sure you grab it. And what I mean by that is never, when that opportunity arises, settle for doing a good job. Um, always go that step further and show people that you belong in that environment. You know, it's a, a really simple thing, like um, in terms of, of how you dress. You know, from day one in the office, when I joined Sky, for example, I was... Uh, one of the smarter, probably the smartest sub-editor because I made an effort. Uh, and then when you need a reporter to, or an extra body to go out and pretend to be a reporter with a cameraman and you're looking around the office for who's presentable, then, then they're going to turn to me because I was already looked apart. And then when I became a reporter, I suppose I was always ready to do the live bit on camera because, again, I always made sure I, I looked smart and was always kind of dressing for the job I wanted as opposed to the, the job I had. And it's simple things, Pete, like having the right attitude as well, you know, um, from day one, making sure you're nice to everybody. And that doesn't mean just the people above you, but that also means the people below you as well, because you never know when you might uh, need to fall on their support too. And there's been plenty of times, let me tell you, when I've had to at Sky. Um, so yeah, I guess there are, there are ways and means where you can make your own luck. And when you get those opportunities, 
really showcasing your ability because if you didn't do that then i guess that door wouldn't open permanently to you um i can only speak from my own experiences and i i have been I, i've got to i've got to be honest with you i've been really lucky you know every little big every little break that came my way was not it wasn't like here's a job being advertised it was oh um so and so has not turned up today to to be our expert on a screen test will you stand in I go and stand in, and then two days later, I'm presenting Sports Centre. Um, someone, I, I go on a shift with Georgie Thompson because uh, Dave Clark is away doing the darts, and uh, in that three weeks while he's away, somebody upstairs has decided that Georgie and I are going to stick together as a partnership, and we end up doing four years together. Uh, you know, would I be doing what I'm doing now or where I am now if if um, Richard Keyes and Andy Gray hadn't left in the manner they did, or or if Ed Chamberlain hadn't decided that he wanted to to go and fulfil his his dream to to work in horse racing. So you know I, I've got to be realistic. I've got however good you are, you need a break sometimes. Uh, I, something you said earlier was about backing yourself, and you've always had this ability to back yourself. And was that the same through your teenage years? Did you always have that innermost confidence? Yeah, and that was probably because of where I grew up, I think. Um, I grew up in, in a, a sleepy North Yorkshire village. And in my primary school, there were, how, how many would it be, 20 boys maybe in a year. Um, I was the fastest kid at school. I was, I was probably the best footballer. I was certainly the best cricketer. Uh, I, I was probably one of the brightest. I was the one who got the parts in the school play. And, and all that stuff that you get from being in a small environment and being, I suppose, a, a big fish in a small pond, that, that gave me some layers of confidence that I probably never lost. Now, you, as soon as you step into the senior school, there's 250 kids in the year, uh, you learn to find your place. But I was, from the age of 11, 12, when there were loads of strikes at schools around that time, uh, teachers were, were abandoning sports clubs and, and after-school activities. Um, they weren't prepared to pick a school team, so they asked me to do it. Um, the teachers when I was 11 and 12 uh, so I had that sort of I don't know the captaincy that leadership thing through throughout my sort of school years but still pursuing drama was on stage quite a bit when there were school productions um, or, or videos to be made I was the guy that they asked to, to present them um, and then stepping from but that was still you know still a very gentle environment really I, I think you know it wasn't Middlesbrough was was down the road but it, we weren't sort of um, exposed to the the difficulties of growing up in in a in a big urban town um so again when i went off to, to college you know you were again adjusting your your pools and, and working out your place within the group um but that that i suppose that confidence that was in me never left me I, it, everything i think about my life there are parallels within football you know you think about matt letizia and, and when I started talking to you then about my upbringing, I was thinking about Matt Letizia at Southampton. He had opportunities to move on, but but it was always very happy and very confident in his own um, in his own space at Southampton, and and got opportunities to go elsewhere and, and never did. Um, I think I would have done all right wherever I stayed, but um, it was just you know it was just the fortune of of going to Sky at the time I did when Sky was a really progressive company, very young company. And they didn't have layers and layers of people at that time who were ready to make those steps up. So I was one of the first major intakes, certainly on the sports side. Uh, so, you know, there was not a lot of opposition if you had talent to, to make that progress further. I think it would be very different now. In fact, I know it is because there are younger people filling the jobs all the way down. So it, it's, it's much harder, I think, to sort of climb that ladder. And obviously, I'm well aware of you at Sky and, and I've seen you on the television. You mentioned Georgie Thompson. I met her many years ago. We did an event in Belfast together. And you guys were brilliant on the, on the TV together whenever you were doing Sky Sports News. Um, but before Sky, what was the journey to get to Sky? You know, I appreciate it was a, a, it was a youngish company at the time. It must have been a really exciting time to be at Sky. Um, but, 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 but before you got there, what, was, what were you doing before that? Um, so I did a history degree and then did a, a postgrad in journalism. I always wanted to be a journalist. And, and that was kind of at my core. Uh, and probably newspaper journalism was what I wanted to go into, and maybe with an ambition of, of being a, a BBC foreign correspondent, someone like 
you know, John Simpson, one of those, one of those kind of people who was a big idol when I was younger, I had all his books, um, read about all his adventures. But I mean, I applied for BBC training schemes and got knocked back. I applied for the Evening Chronicle training scheme in Newcastle and, and, and got knocked back. You know, I, I had to go about it a different way. So um, I did a postgrad after my history degree, which was purely journalism and journalism techniques. Uh, an NCTJ course, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and then um, I took the first job that was going uh, that I saw at that time. So this is summer of '96, uh, and that was the Derbyshire Times in Chesterfield. Didn't know Chesterfield, never heard of the Derbyshire Times, uh, but I thought I, this is a job, and and I need a job um, to make my next steps as a journalist. So I'm just going to go for it and, and have a look and got the job. Again, there was a bit of fortune involved there because they actually offered it first to a mate of mine uh, who turned it down because he wanted to move to London. And he didn't tell me um, that he turned the job down or that it had been offered to him. It was left to somebody on my first day of work to, to raise that and say, how did you handle that between the two of you? And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. A massive, dent to my, massive dent to my pride. Uh, you know, I felt sick to the stomach. Um, I thought, you know, what an amazing mate he'd been because he didn't tell me any he might have thought it would have put me off, but um, I, I was, I felt, you know, it took me quite a, a long time to recover from that actually, but I realized that I was just being silly. They, they thought I was a bit too cocky at the interview, it turned out. Um, I, I, was, I went in there armed with, a, with 10 reasons why I thought their paper was, was, could improve. Um, and I think the news editor, <clears throat> the deputy ed editor thought it was brilliant and, and wanted to hire me and the news editor, uh, was less than impressed that I was sort of telling her her paper was rubbish. So um, <laughs> any, anyway, I ended up getting the job and it was a brilliant training ground for me because that news editor and I still have a very good relationship all these years on. She's now a journalist trainer um, and she was brilliant, an absolute talent, as was her deputy Tracy, an all female team who, who toughened me up, um, showed me what it is to be a proper news hound. And there was another guy, Phil Bramley, again, a super talented writer. He could have done anything. Uh, and a lot of these guys could actually, but they, they were very happy with where they were geographically and had various connections and ties that I never did. And I was very fortunate in that sense. Um, so I was very lucky to work with a really talented pool of people who were very supportive, who gave me amazing opportunities to, to try my hand at all sorts of stuff. Crime reporting, you know, death knocks, um, politics. Uh, Tony Benn was our a local MP and was quite heavily involved in, in, in talks with Sinn Féin at the time. So I got myself all involved with that, um, which was fascinating for a, for a young journalist. Um, and then it was really after two years, I was, I was never any doubt that I was going to leave. I mean, I had a girlfriend, um, but she was well aware that as soon as I had, had qualified and done my time on the paper, I was, I was moving on. The question was always going to be what that next step was. Was it going to be a a, just a bigger paper? Was it going to be something like the Sheffield Star, the Bristol Evening Post, or, or maybe a move back to the North East, uh, at Newcastle, the Chronicle or the Journal? Um, you know, a good, a good local paper, daily newspaper. But then, then this advert for, for Sky popped up and I and, and hundreds of others saw it in The Guardian on Media Monday and applied and was lucky enough to get an interview. Um, and when that interview chance came up, I talking about doing a bit more, I made a film and I went to Chesterfield FC and did a piece there with the manager. I did a piece with um, Derbyshire County Cricket Club and, and sort of bolted it together with a top and a tail and um, sent it off. And I think that the boss at, at Sky probably thought uh, I had a bit of initiative. Um, and because I was had a newspaper background, as he did as well, I think he had a soft spot for me for that reason and gave me a, gave me a chance. And... Um, 23 years late, 22 years later here, I'm still there. <laughs> and you know what? That's the thing. And certainly for me, I remember getting the job I'm in now, uh, what, 15, 16 years ago, uh, first time around. Um, and, and I remember the moment getting the job and it was all I was working towards was getting the job. And then when I got it, it was the realization of, well, you've been working towards getting it. Now you've got it. Now you've got to keep it. Now you've got to make it a success. And, and that can be, that, 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 I, I always remember that moment, probably in the same way as you remember that moment of going for that interview and being, they saw you as being a bit cocky. I guarantee when you went to Sky, 
you weren't the cocky person or, or, or reined it in a little bit that time around, would that be right? Uh, <laughs> I wasn't lacking confidence. I was probably never lacking confidence. I think I had confidence in the way I work. I probably, what had probably changed about me by the time I came to London, I was probably a little bit less forth, forthcoming on a personal level. Um, but when it came to uh, going out and do, doing the job, then I, then I think I was, I always backed myself in those terms. I, I remember one of the very first, I think the first week I was there, they always sent it out for a little test. And I was sent out with this guy um, called Tom to Millbank and David Meller, the sports minister was there and there was going to be a, a gaggle of people and, and it was our job to try and get an interview with him afterwards. And so that was it. You know, I, I was in that situation. I was going to get that interview no matter what. Uh, it wasn't, I don't think it was a case of me trying to prove anything, but it was, um, that's just what I did. I just had a focus about my work. And so, yeah, we made sure that when that news conference finished, I was the first person there, elbows out, um, getting my cameraman behind me, uh, having never done it before, and thrusting a microphone in, in David Mellor's face. And I remember this guy, Tom, saying to me years afterwards, he couldn't believe what he'd seen. And he kind of realized, he said to me, he realized, what he had to do to get to that place uh, having having watched me do it um and i probably assumed that we were all on the same starting level but it, it wasn't the case that goes back to my Derbyshire times those two years there which hardened me up um to make me a journalist and you know years later being in berlin for example at the world cup in 2006 and there's a big story breaking around gosh i can't even remember what it was but set blatter was in berlin and there was just a, a pack of journalists trying to get around him and I made sure that, boom, I was in the middle of it, elbows out, and, and making sure I gained eye contact with Seth Blatter and, and getting my questions away before worrying about what anyone else was doing. Um, I, I think that part of the job has really helped me with the, the job that I do now because I still think like a journalist. You know, that's my first and foremost. And probably a lot of people do it the other way around. They are presenters, and then they have to work out how they're going to think about the right questions to ask, whereas my starting point is, I know where we are with the story and, and, and what I'm going to go with, but then I have to put the, the presenting gloss on it, which probably doesn't come as naturally to me as it does with some others. Well, do you know what? I think you're a damn fine presenter, and I'm not just saying that. Um, your questions are great. But what, what, the interesting thing for me is working with the characters that you work with, you know, and that can be, I would imagine, extremely challenging at times. And maybe we'll come on to, to some of the awkward positions that maybe you have been in. But does it help for you about building a relationship with them? So you work regularly with, with Jimmy Redknapp. You uh, work regularly, obviously, with Gary Neville um, and with Jimmy Carragher. You work with Graham Sunis and, and, and Jose Mourinho. And the list goes on. Well, more so, I suppose, before you took the Spurs job. The list goes on. Um, do you feel in order to make that uh, spark on television happen that you have to have a close bond with them, more of a friendship bond? Do you work in that relationship? Or is it very much... You sit in the studio, lights on, boom, let's go. Um, I, I've learned over time, Pete, that you have to have that bond. And probably when I first came into the job, that was the most difficult thing because it's not there instantly. They don't know who you are. They don't know your backstory. They don't know if you know anything about football. Um, and probably because of the background I'd had, I was a bit too direct with my questions initially. Uh, and that came from the sports news background and, and working for an editor who was, was very journalistically driven as well. And so you were always tr trying to impress him ultimately by getting good news lines and, and, and making headlines. And when you move across into the, the sports side of things at Sky, you realize it's a, there's a bit more give and take. It's about building relationships to get the best out of people rather than making them feel like they're being put on the spot. There's a time and place for that, but you have to get that to that bit secondary you have to build that relationship first and that wasn't always easy got to be totally honest about that that wasn't easy and how did I do that um I think you I learned that you couldn't do it by being the loud guy in the room there were other people ready to do that you know Jeff Shreves is someone who's who's very good at that um I was I was someone who was more uh reticent to offer an opinion and then wait till somebody asked me and I started to notice that people were asking me more and more, um, whether that was Gary Neville or Jamie Carragher, what do you think, Dave, about this? What do you think about that? And they would, there would be a realisation, I guess, over time that this guy did know a little bit about football 
I mean, I, I've had a very good education through Sky. Um, I mean, we all think, you know, football, right? But I think I had a very good education for three years working with Peter Beagree on the Football League and then three years working exclusively with Jamie Redknapp, really, on the on Saturday Night Football. And uh, Jamie knows football. He really knows football. And, you know, I learned a lot just by by spending that three years with him. Uh, and Glenn Hoddle was, was someone I worked with a lot in those early days as well. And, and crikey, there are not many people that know more about football than Glenn. And you suddenly start seeing the game through different eyes. And then being around Graham Souness for all that period of time, Ray Wilkins um, w- was very generous with his time and thoughts and, and would be quite happy for me to just, you know, fire away, Dave, whatever you want to ask me about this game um, while we're off camera, because I've, I've always had questions. I want to know more. So you start building the, that rapport with those guys. And then I think when when people like Roy Keane or Jose Mourinho come into that environment, they can see there is a respect there. Uh, I'm not just, you know, um, the guy in the corner asking questions. I'm, I'm very much part of that process and part of that team. And you get to a position where, um, you know, I went out for lunch with Jose um, at the start of the season and managed to convince him it was a good thing for him to join us for that first game of the season at Old Trafford, Man U Chelsea, which he wasn't going to do initially. Um, persuaded, well, part of the, the group that persuaded Roy to uh, join us for a Christmas lunch, uh, our traditional Sky big celebration that we have every December. Um, and Roy came down on the train just for the day, just to be part of that team environment. Um, but that was my idea and, and made the suggestion to Roy in the first place. And, and, then you, and then you sort of build up those layers with people and you have fun off camera together but they know it's all part of the process as well. And the bigger picture is making good television. So when there are moments where you don't agree and there is conflict, that's fine. Let it all go off. Um, But we have to remember at the end of that hour or couple of hours or that weekend um, that actually we're all in this together. We're, we're a team. That's, that's how I treat us. We're a team. Um, And I'm a, key part of that team and and should be treated as such even though sometimes my job is to make them feel awkward and, and put them on the spot and, and do you know what you do that so brilliantly and and the one thing that i take from that is that you know you work at sky you work on premier league football it is the the top sports broadcasting that you're doing and you you are very much calling a lot of those shots people will think uh, that there's a whole host of producers in the background, which there is, and they will think that it's all handed to you on a plate. But as you've just said, you made the, the lunch happen. You made these things happen because it's for the greater good. It's for the benefit of the show. Um, and people will think that the, the presenter doesn't do that. It's just sort of handed to them on a plate. I know personally from my own experience, anything that you want to get, you, you have to try and go and make it happen yourself because if you're waiting for someone else to do it for you, they, they won't. Yeah. Um... I mean, we do we do have some very good producers, Pete. I would say that as well. And there are times when I have to bow to them uh, on certain things, and we might come onto that. But um, I'm driving that ship on a Sunday, um, particularly on a Sunday. Monday is, is is a bit more of a controlled environment up to a point. Uh, but the Sunday, I'm pretty much left to get on with it because that's the relationship I have with that producer, certainly post-match. And he will set confines within that and say, you know, you've got 10 minutes. I want to get to this interview and I want to get to that interview. So make sure you do this analysis quickly. And and then I'll say, well, how much have I got left? And he'll say, you've got 30 minutes. We'll give it, we'll give you 15 minutes per part. And I'll say, no, I want 20 minutes. I need 20 minutes to do Manchester United. So he'll give me 20 minutes. And, and then basically it's up to me how I drive that conversation. And and I won't be thinking off the cuff. I'll be, I'll have planned ahead. I'll, you know, worked out scenarios in my head. Um, where that conversation might go. I'm listening from the very moment those guys arrive on a Sunday to see what their perspective is, to see if there are any areas of conflict that I might be able to drive a wedge in um, and exploit to my advantage and to, I would say, television's advantage as well, because we all like a good row. Um, And I think it makes it more entertaining unless people are sitting around agreeing all the time can get a bit dull. Uh, So, you know, that's what I'm doing on a, on a weekly basis. And that last hour on a super Sunday, that's when uh, you're probably feeling jaded because you've been there all day. You've traveled to wherever you've got to and, and stayed in a hotel 
which might not be the best hotel in the world the night before, and it got gets to the your sort of well, how would it be ninth hour in the studio, um, and that's when you've got to be at your peak, and that's what you have to prepare for every week to be ready to fly in that hour, drive it editorially, and 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 drive an hour of content that people are going to be talking about for the rest of the week as well. Do you prefer Monday Night Football or do you prefer Super Sunday? Uh, I have good good ones and bad ones of both, I would say. You know, if we've got a really good guest on a Monday night football, I really enjoy that. Um, I, I, you know, I, you can't substitute being at the games. Being at a big game, um, which we which we get to do on a Sunday every week, is, is an absolute privilege. To, and to feel that atmosphere, which we're going to have to do without, obviously, for a while. But um, you, 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 you thrive on that adrenaline, that buzz. You can see a lot more with your own eyes when, when you're actually there. Uh, the guys thrive off it a little bit as well. Monday is is much more of a disciplined day, which which starts early. There's a lot of preparation, um, a lot of conversation, uh, and and the actual physical rehearsal bef- of the first hour of the program before we actually get into the studio at seven o'clock. So um, I can come off air on a, on a Monday night football if we've had a good guest and a good game and, and feeling absolutely. Yeah, top of the world, um, but it's, it's it's never quite the same as being there on a Sunday, I would say. Um, but I can think of some brilliant guests that we've had, you know, like Jurgen Klopp, Pep Guardiola, um, guests who've surprised me. David Ginola was great fun. Um, I mean, there are too too many, I, and I have this awful memory with with guests. They fly out fly out of my head the minute that we've we've done the show with them. But uh, yeah, we can have some we can have some good Mondays as well. Do you, have a, do you have a pinch yourself moment? Do you ever fanboy? Do you ever think to yourself, man, I'm sitting in the studio right now with whoever it is? Not really. And I think that's probably because um, I had a different relationship with football than I did with cricket growing up. I loved football, but it was not sort of, uh, um, my family weren't, weren't sort of live and die by it. My dad was more into cricket and rugby and you know, I was watching and playing cricket probably from an earlier age than I was football. I think I sort of grabbed the football thing myself and ran with it from the age of about seven or eight. And then it became a real passion after that um, when I persuaded my dad to take us to Sunderland. Um, but but cricket, you know, I've had pinch myself moments when I've been around some legendary cricketers of the, of the, like the 70s and 80s and early 90s, guys that I used to watch when I was a kid. Um, who I've been really, in, I mean, I used to have an autograph book. I used to take round to, to cricket matches and try and run on and, and get players' interviews as they went off for tea and things like that. Um, players' autographs and they went off for tea. But um, football hasn't really been like that for me. But it's still, you know, I, I, it doesn't escape me when I'm sitting there in a studio with Roy Keane, Jose Munio, Graham Souness, and Gary Neville that I am in privileged territory and I'm in a room with four sizable egos and I'm the guy that everyone's looking to to control it I mean they are I do allow myself a little moment now and again just to I'm not in awe of it just to sit back and and make sure you enjoy this and make sure that you relish every second of this because you never know how long this is going to last you know what I think about that with what I do I'm not comparing us like for like but I think about that (laughs) yeah because I want to enjoy the moment because it won't last forever um, football has got so sanitized. You can look back at the the 80s and the 90s and you could maybe say that there was more characters in the game back then. I'm sure the characters exist still within the football club, but we don't get to see them as much anymore. And does it frustrate you sometimes? You know, you come to a Monday night football, the headphones are passed over to whoever it is in the tunnel. You know, there's questions being asked or, or wherever it is. Um, and, and it can be the same old, same old. You know, we didn't turn up today. It was this, it was that. It was just the same old rigmarole that they're coming off with. And does that frustrate you when it happens? Yeah, it does. But I think we know who the characters are, Pete. I think by and large, we know. And and it's lovely when we are surprised. You know, if if you're doing a West Ham game, I mean, it's a bit of a cliche, but you're going to get a great interview from Mark Noble because he's a really good talker and he's honest. Um, Aston Villa, Jack Grealish stood there with his socks rolled down and he doesn't deal in cliches he's just honest that's a default setting um i think i think to a game this year one of the best pre-match uh, post-match interviews we've ever had was was the longstaff brothers 
uh, after um, Newcastle beat Manchester United. And, and the delight on Matty Longstaff's face, and I'm saying this as a Sunderland fan, but it was just so infectious that you couldn't help but being yourself watching it because of his, his, his kind of real boyhood enthusiasm was shining through. I suppose the problem is when, when these guys, as happens in football these days, they get built up, they get knocked down, and they build up layers of, of toughness around them. Um, and it's up to us to, stand up, to try and still pick through those, those layers of protection to, to get the characters within. But there are still, I think there are still plenty of characters within football, but I think we've been guilty of, of the way that um, we put them under so much scrutiny it does toughen them up, and I'm afraid of an effect of that. It does sanitise them occasionally. Uh, do you ever come off air and think to yourself, oh, I missed that. I should have asked that question. Or do you ever come off air thinking, I wish I hadn't have asked that? Uh, absolutely yes to both. Probably on a weekly basis, probably on a daily basis. I mean, I did it this morning. Um, I mean, every, every day, that, every, day I, every time I do an interview, it's, it's very rare that I do a perfect interview. I can't, I can't think of one on the top of my head that I've that I've done and thought, oh my God, that was amazing, that was brilliant. Um, and I suppose there's an element of that why I'm still doing what I'm doing because I'm never satisfied and I'm always trying to get better at it. Um, yeah, you, you you can ask clumsy questions and, and sometimes I'll think, well, if I hadn't had the producer talking in my ear at the wrong time or if, if Carragher hadn't come in at that point or if Gary hadn't said that, then it would have been easier for me to, to do that. But you've got to take control of it yourself. You, you know, you've got to take responsibility of it yourself, not blame other people. Um, there are loads of times when I think, oh, I wish I'd just phrased this differently or, or it's, it's not even interviews all the time, Pete. It's, it's the way I've got into a break sometimes. It's the way I've, I've picked up at the full-time whistle. This stuff isn't scripted. It's coming off the top of your head. And I'm thinking there in, in that example, you know, I'm thinking, if I was sitting at home, what would I be thinking? What would I be saying? You know, what's the big story here? Um, and, and trying to find the right words to, to put what everyone has just seen in, in some kind of context, not just for the 90 minutes, but for the bigger picture as well. And I'll listen to those sometimes back and think, where was I going then? You know, I, I might have got a stat wrong or something like that or misheard a stat. And, oh, gosh, Pete, there are so many things I do wrong. It's not true, honestly. But um, I, unfortunately, I'm the first one to, to realise that, and I don't need other people to tell me. <laughs> um, how do you prepare for an interview? I mean, a lot of people will be listening to this and thinking of themselves. Well, how, do, how do you prep for it? Um, and and do you have a do you have a mannerism? With, do you have the same process with each interview that you do? I suppose it depends on on what kind of relationship I would have with them. I, I spoke to Sir Kenny Dalglish this morning, and I decided to treat him with, with great deference because I remember um, how sharp he could be with journalists and I see him someone with such a stature in the game. He doesn't need someone like me asking him stupid questions. So um, that's how I played that interview. Uh, there are times when you feel like you've got to go on the front foot and, and, be bullish with people but yeah I think you have to adapt your manner and I, it's something I very much do a, a, according to my subject the age of the subject the, the level of respect you have for that person based on their age and experience and, and what they've done in the game I guess um, sometimes you, you try and play to their level a little bit um, but ultimately I, I want to I want to get elicit good responses, Pete. I suppose that's my starting point in any interview. And, and the process has to be very different to do that with each subject because they are so different as people. So uh, I, get, I, get, and I guess that's something that you learn over time. You can't, you can't go into the same fight with the same tactic every time. I remember very early on being told that Harry Redknapp was a, was a pushover at West Ham when I used to go to the training ground there. So I decided to go in one day with a load of stats about how his team had been underperforming. And um, he effed and jeffed at me and, and told me where to go, you know, and I had to disappear with my tail between my legs. I learned with Harry there was a different way to go about it. If I blow smoke up his backside, he's going to tell me what's wrong with his team, actually. And that was the tactic I used with, with Harry um, for the subsequent years. With Sir Alex Ferguson, I always went in incredibly well prepped, but it would always try and make him think 
because I figured over a period of time that to get better answers out of him, I had to ask a question that he hadn't been asked before, or at least to be asking it in a different way. Um, and, and that process of making him think, I found got a better response from him. So it really is, it's, it's, it's horses for courses, but your, your ideal, what you're trying to get out of it every time is, is the best answer. So if that means you've just got to say to someone, you were brilliant today, and you get a, a one minute response about what they did and, and you get some insight, then that's fine. If, if there's another time you have to ask a, a 30 second question, then you have to go about it that way. But generally I try and keep the, the questions as, as unlike my answers. I tend to keep, I try to keep my questions as, as concise and clear uh, and to the point as possible. So being the person who always asks the questions, I always ask the question, how do you feel whenever you're being asked the question? Uh, I, I would say I've got a bit better at it and, and I understand why now why there's people want to ask me questions which I didn't get for quite a long time and, and felt like I had nothing to say and I suppose through that process of, of going on LinkedIn and engaging with, with people a little bit more made me realise that um, I had something to say that, that, and some of it sometimes had an impact on people I guess you know uh, people who um, wanted to go into journalism or interested in my career or that sort of stuff. Um, it's much easier, I think, asking questions than answering them. And so I have great respect for the guys that do it for us because they're so brilliant at it, generally, and very good at getting to their point quickly and, and then coming up with an answer that, that really resonates. So you mentioned LinkedIn. So you're a top voice on LinkedIn. What, 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 made you decide to go onto LinkedIn first and foremost and what is this top voice what's the criteria for that how did all that come about <laughs> I've absolutely no idea Pete they, they asked me if I would consider being a top voice and um, yeah I said okay I think I think what it was that I, I did some videos last year and, and put some posts on there that had an incredible reach and I, I suppose I, I sort of dipped my toe in the water a little bit to see if this was something worth doing I was being approached by lots of people asking, how do I get to do this? How do I get to do that? And rather than asking, answering them all individually, I thought maybe it's better if I actually start putting some posts out here um, or whatever it was there, how to, there are no shortcuts. It's all about hard work and determination, da, da, da. And I found I put one of these out and I didn't think too much about it. And then a, a few days later I checked and it had been viewed by 2 million people. Uh -huh. or it had had 2 million views, which I suspect is a very different thing. And so I followed it up with something else a couple of weeks later. And again, it went over a million and did it again. It went over a million. So that, at that point, LinkedIn contacted me and said, um, would you consider being a, a top voice? I, I don't think it really means anything apart from having a banner next to my name and it only lasts for a year as well. And I suspect I haven't really fulfilled any of the criteria because I got really busy and <laughs> I've done a lot less probably on there than I intended to. But I, I, I I told me the idea of doing some more live stuff and I, I found it, it didn't really have much. I didn't feel it had much of a reach. Uh, I think you've got to be patient with it, with these things and build up an audience. But um, I didn't feel inclined to do that uh, because I've got other, other um, people a bit more demanding of my time than LinkedIn that uh, I probably owe it to a little bit more as well, like Sky. So um, it was, it was good fun doing that and I will do some more stuff with it and, and the reason I went on there in the first place probably because it was a bit of a friendlier place than, than the other social media with um, Twitter which I find quite brutal and um, but, but a very necessary professional tool I have to say Twitter still and Instagram where uh, it is a nicer place still but um, it just connects me I think with a different audience more of a professional audience and the other reason to be brutally honest I don't have an agent and I thought it would be a, a a more direct way to go to potential clients around corporate work or, or whatever, whatever that might be. Now, one did come out of it, uh, a nice relationship with Y Scout, which um, is, is still ongoing. And there've been one or two other things that are in the pipeline that have come through there as well. Developed a nice relationship with Peter Express, which came through LinkedIn. And I've had several meetings with them about potentially working with them on, on different projects uh, in the future. It's something that really interests me, the, the, the business angle, I've got a few fingers in pies, Pete, and um, it keeps me interested and stimulated. Absolutely. And, and, you know, away from Sky, you're still involved in football. You're a non-exec director at, at Sunderland. Yes. Yeah. And you're a fan of Sunderland. Yes. Yeah. 
And so that must be amazing. How did that come about? And if Sunderland were back in the Premier League, would that put you in a difficult position? Yeah, I think it probably would. And the likelihood is um, I would I would step away from it then, but I would step away with a with a you know smile from ear to ear because I'd feel like I've done my job. Um, how did it come about? Well, I'd, I'd been a non-executive director at Oxford United for three years and had a lot of fun and learnt a lot and had an amazing experience working, a bit like the Derbyshire Times example, working at a smaller football club where they're, they are you know, not blessed with, with teams and teams of staff. So you get to dip your toe in, in every aspect of the football club as a, a director for a club like that with, a, with, a, with an owner who was very open to outside views, which is why he hired me in the first place. Uh, and I found myself contributing in all all sorts of different areas of the club that I didn't expect to, but that, but primarily became a focus on football there. And I uh, helped them recruit one manager and almost a second uh, before a takeover happened. Um, I helped them sell several players and was involved in 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 doing that, and then became a, a key part of the recruitment team. And when I say that, I don't mean I was the guy that was going out looking at players. I was not the one on Y Scout saying yes or no. But what I was doing was was bringing, um, I would say, a football sense and a bit of now to those discussions, uh, so that we made sure we were targeting the right people in the right areas and acting in the best interest of the football club as opposed to uh, the coach, protecting the club's assets essentially and and trying to increase the the value of of, of assets incoming. I'd love to get to the same position at Sunderland. We're not there yet. Um, I found it a very frustrating first six months, to be honest, Pete, because it's been a difficult time, not just with, with COVID, but there's a lot of layers already in place at Sunderland that are quite hard to, to break down and make an impact on. And I would say I am in the process of trying to, to have an impact there. And it hasn't gone as I wished it to yet. It's been a pretty bumpy ride, but I'm, I'm hanging in there. And uh, I'm hopeful that I'm hopeful that um, we can start building the fabric of the football club in the right areas to to see it making real progress. Um, and that that can start now. And I would say it is actually starting now. I uh, I love the fact that you phoned some of the club's fans during the COVID crisis just to see how they're doing. I thought that was a really nice touch. Oh, thanks. I, mean, I didn't do it for praise, Pete. I'll be honest. I mean, I did it because I thought it was the right thing to do. You know, I was I was there as a director of the club and I could see that we were furloughing people left, right and centre, um, which we we're perfectly entitled to do and absolutely the right thing to do for a, for a League One football club, which is what we are. We're not a Premier League club anymore with, with their kind of income. Um, I, I, I contacted the foundation and said, look, what can I do to help in this time? Um, and I had the idea that maybe I phoned some people, but I didn't know who that was or what that looked like. Could they facilitate that for me? And they came back within a couple of days with a list of people uh, and said, these people would all appreciate a phone call. They're all either part of the Sunderland senior supporters group, or they involved in walking football at the foundation, um, but they're all, They've all got Sunderland at their heart. So I just felt it was the right thing to do as a, as a director of the football club to be reaching out. And there didn't seem to be any other people around that were, were ready to do that or, or in a position to be able to do that. And so I was, I was very happy to. And it was really interesting, actually. I was thinking about it this morning, funnily enough, because um, I probably need to start round two because I've got through everybody on the list. And I've learned a lot. I learned a lot about the football club, about the community, because I'm not actually from Sunderland myself. So every time I speak to one of these uh, people, men and women, uh, I learn something about the city, um, what it used to be like, um, you know, bits and bits and bobs of, of stories of the past, of, of great players, great managers. Uh, so it's been a real education, and I think it's helped tie my bond to the city without without a doubt. And uh, the, 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 the strain that goes through all these conversations is well when when it's done we'll all get together and, and have a, a good old um, we'll probably have a good old tea party a bit of tea and cake is probably how we'll celebrate when when we're allowed to and the sooner the better that's for sure for us yeah. all a couple of final questions for you sure. you, you, you mentioned twitter um earlier and it can be a brutal place um 
and it can be a brutal place. How, how do you deal with that? Uh, badly at times. I, c- I couldn't give anyone lessons on how to deal with it, Pete, because I, I've not handled it well, well myself at times. Um, the worst one for me was, was pre-Christmas when um, I had to correct, or not correct, but I had to pick up on what Gary Neville had said about um, the root of racism in, in football. And it's a subject that I'm very passionate about. It's very close to my heart. Um, but I was in an invidious position where I was being told I had to distance ourselves from those comments because he'd, he'd brought the politicians and politics into it and the prime minister. And um, in, in trying to clear that up, I did so pretty clumsily and found myself the subject of, of uh, a Twitter onslaught, which I wouldn't wish on anybody. And it was pretty unpleasant and it was a few days before Christmas and for me Christmas was kind of cancelled it was uh, it took me a long time to get over it um, I always say to people you shouldn't you shouldn't listen to to what people say on Twitter because they don't know you they don't know what you're experiencing they don't know what you're going through and I suppose the, the positive that came out of that experience was the amount of messages that I got and, and mainly personal and private and direct messages from people um, supporting me people I'd never considered to be in my corner or never would have thought would be in my corner uh I'd made a I'd made a mistake at at the worst possible moment um by just not clarifying the fact that it was the political comments that we had to distance ourselves from and nothing else so that was a that was a very dark time and and how do I deal with it since well I probably deal with it now by going on there a lot less um not really saying much myself on there because anything you do say just invites a wave of stuff back and it's generally from people like to say who 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 want to throw stones and that's what they get pleasure from and you know each to their own i might be a, a different position um a different person if i wasn't you know didn't have a role in the public eye and i might decide to throw stones at people who i didn't like on television or i thought asked stupid questions or um didn't like the tie they were wearing or their shoes or, or whatever it was you know I might do that but uh, I, I know what it's like on the other side so I, I, I think I'm right in saying I've never criticized anybody I can't think that I've ever criticized anybody on Twitter about anything which has been hard at times especially when you're a Sunderland fan um, <laughs> it has its challenges uh, I would say to a you know, presenter now if you feel like you have to go on there do but um, try not to try not to, try not to take it to heart, and develop a thick skin, which is which is obviously what I I I had done previously, but I, I had to make it just a bit thicker. I admire your honesty wholeheartedly. Just want to pick up on you being a Sunderland fan. What do you make of the the potential takeover at Newcastle? Um, it's a tricky one. It's a tricky one. I get why they're so excited, although I think they're a bit nervous now because it's going on a bit, but uh, I get the possibility is is enormous and immense, and it's easy to see that Newcastle is a club of great potential in the same way that Sunderland is because the people in the North East just live and die by football, and they will come in there thousands and thousands if you get it right, and they will, well, they are the most loyal fans um, Crikey, the Sunderland fans come home and away without fail. But that's a Newcastle question, not a Sunderland question. <laughs> but there's also this side, the, the, the human rights aspect, and I get, I guess, I get why that is 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 a problem for a lot of people as well. You know, it's it's a murky area. If they came to Sunderland, would I object? I can't say that I I would necessarily because i think if it the the governing bodies have got to be the one that make those decisions if people want to invest in your communities and your areas and the good that would do i think sometimes you probably have to you probably have to be a little bit selfish about it um and you hope that the the bigger picture the bigger authorities put pressure in areas where they should be without that having to be your decision do you see what i'm i'm getting out there but um Listen, I think it's going to, if, if they do go, go through with it and, and Newcastle do get an enormous investment, it's only going to make our job harder because that just becomes such a direct comparison then about where they are and where we are in the same way that it, it made Manchester United's life very difficult, uh, certainly post-Ferguson. Um, 
because they were being held up to this all-conquering Manchester City team that wasn't there before. If you were to go back in time and you could say to your 18-year-old self, give your 18-year-old self a little bit of advice, what would it be? Um, I never fulfilled my potential academically. So at that age, I would be saying, make sure you do that. Oh, this is 18 though. So I've done my A-levels and I've already messed those up, haven't I? Right, okay. Um, what am I doing subsequently? I was so focused on my career for such a long time that it came at the expense of everything else, probably from the ages of 23 or four through to uh, after the birth of my son, probably to the age of about 35. So 10 or 12 years, and that's all I could see. Uh, I, I, I would like to have started a family earlier. Um, now things don't work out like that, do they? You know, you you end up doing what you do, but um, and you you know you can only do that if you meet the right person at the right time, which I didn't, unfortunately. <laughs> so um, I would like to have done that. So I might have I might have said to myself, don't lose sight of the big picture, and and um, you know, because at my stage of life now, forty six. Uh, to me family is everything I have one son and I I would love to have had three or four um, and that didn't happen for us uh, and the bigger picture I think is is family and you think about it even more at times like this ultimately we all strive to to make the most of our lives and, and be the best we can be and, and have great jobs and be successful and earn money and whatever um, but there's nothing that's more important in life than family uh, and I would probably remind my 18 year old self of that I'm an only child, like your son, and uh, I never knew any different. And for me, growing up as an only child, um, I've had a wonderful time. And uh, I don't think it's... People always say to me things like, oh, don't you wish you had a brother or sister? And I feel that what you never had, you never missed. And I was very fortunate to have a, a very close bond to my mum and dad. So being an only child in my, in, uh, in my world is not this... Uh, is it's not a disadvantage in any shape or form. If that, no, and I, I don't mean to, I don't mean to portray it as that. No, uh, no, no, you but, haven't portrayed but, it as that. I just want to say I, that. My... Yeah, I'm I'm thinking of it purely from a really selfish perspective, Pete, because I, I you know, in my dotage, I would love to have you know a house full of of children and grandchildren, and and all the pressure as it is on you is on is on Oscar to come up trumps on that front. <laughs> <laughs> Right back at the start, I asked you if you're living the dream and you said that, well, your dreams and aspirations change with life. So as a 46 year old man now in a very, uh, a, a hugely successful job doing uh, an amazing, amazing thing in the top of your game in sports broadcasting. What, what, what's the, what, what's the next thing for Dave Jones? Um, I love my job, Pete. And, I guess I'd love to build, carry on building the relationship I've got with, with our public, which I feel is, is only really just got started. You know, even though I've been around a long time, you know, you have to be a real Sky Sports enthusiast, I think, to know that. Um, and I felt the change when I stepped into the Super Sunday and Monday Night Football um, in terms of the exposure and the sort of the recognition on a daily basis. Um, around the place and I'd like to continue building that relationship and I think we had just started that and it was working and so I feel like people are still just getting to know me and I think it took me a couple of years probably if I'm honest to to really feel like I I felt comfortable in that chair I, I had to stop doing it the way other people wanted me to do it and, and start doing it the way that I wanted to do it and, and I'm in that place now um, I can't wait for for us to go back to it and, and carry on doing something that I love and that I'm so passionate about. And really there's, there's not a, another job that I can tell you about or, you know, a career aspiration in that sense. I'd, I'd like to continue building up um, my, my work outside Sky, my interests outside Sky. Um, 
you know, help to make Sunland successful again. That would be amazing if, if I was able to, to have an impact on them in a positive way. Um, for me, it's probably now at this stage about giving back a little bit more and, and, and thinking about ways I can improve that and, and how I go about that. It's, it's difficult because, and that's another thing that's come of LinkedIn, is the amount of charities that get in touch with you um, and, and want you to help them. And of course they do, because everyone's, everyone's very passionate about their own charities. But, and it's very difficult to then be selective about the ones that you do help and, and the ones that you have to um, walk past or say no to. But um, that is an area that I'm continuing to work on. And, um, you know, I think that, that came to me as a bit of an epiphany a couple of years ago when I thought I haven't really this has all been about me and I need to start helping other people. Um, so I'd, I'd like to expand that a little bit. Dave Jones, um, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. Thank you so much for, for coming on, for being so open and for being um, so honest and for sharing your journey. It's been an incredible ride and it sounds to me like there's a heck of a lot more to come. Pete, thank you for your time and thank you for your interest. And, and the reason I've been so open and honest is because you're a Damn good interview. I didn't mean to be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You know what? I really appreciate that. That means a lot. Thank you. <laughs> I wish you all the, all the best, all the, all the luck in the world, Pete, and all the success.